Hello Stockholm, great to be back. Third time lucky, Agile People Conference. So, let's talk about doing strategy, the thing, and uh, of course what it is in, in the modern way, in this new landscape of Lean and Agile and Kinevin and things. This VUCA world that we heard uh, in the previous talk. And of course a few uh, experiments that we've tried and see if we can find some patterns and we can have some insights and some learnings from these experiments. And this is speed talk, so let's proceed with speed. So the story I will sort of try to convey is from strategy as chess. You know, you have a grand chess master, you have set rules, fixed pieces and the chessboard and you know quite slow game where someone is making all the moves and the pawns and the pieces on the chessboard they're just sort of executing what the big brain has come up with. So let's move away from that and let's look at strategy as football. You know, very fluid, fast game with, you know, people who collaborate, they play together and they win together and they lose together and they have their own individual moves based on an overall mission or purpose for their team. So that's a metaphor that I would like us to explore the coming few minutes. Okay? So, my name is Erik Kuhn. Uh, I happen to play football, so that's why I like this metaphor. And I worked at a few co cool companies, Netent, the online gaming company, uh, Ericsson, the big telco, and Framfab. Anyone remembers Framfab? Yeah? From three to three thousand people in three years, and then we crashed and burned. That was something of an experience. Did we have a strategy? Yes, we did. Why strategy? Well, you know, you heard the previous speaker talking about this VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, and it was VUCA already in 18-something when, when uh, Hukusai, the, the Japanese woodblock painter, made this freak wave. So there's been things going on all throughout history, but what is happening now with the digital thing that we are all aware of is that things go by three orders of magnitude higher speed. It's a factor 1000 with bits traveling much faster than atoms. So that's the big difference, I would say. So then, of course, we need a strategy. We need to have an idea of where we're going and the direction and what choices we make to sustainably thrive in this world where the rate of change is never slower than today. What is strategy? Yeah, I'm not going to ask you, I'm going to answer because this is speed talk. So, uh, this is a brilliant lady called Melissa Perry, and I really like this definition because this is totally in line with, with what we have learned, um, you know, lean and agile and, and Kinevin and all these things. So, strategy, it's a system, you know, achievable goals, visions, working together, align a team around desirable outcomes, both for customers and the business. And it emerges from experiments towards a goal or in a certain direction. So I think this is a very good modern working definition of what strategy is. So how do you do this? This could be seen as very abstract, right? How do you do it? Enough with definitions and theory. Let's get down to business, right? How do you do it in a real business context? Who's this? Jack Welsh. Some people say he's the best CEO of the 20th century. And uh, let's hear it from Jack. Real life strategy is very simple. General direction, implement like hell. Would you agree? Is it that simple? Uh, Let's, let's move on. Oh, who's this guy? Another old gentleman. It's Dr. Deming, the quality guru who ja uh, inspired the Japanese industry in the second half of the 20th century. And, you know, he's on the line and he looks pretty upset. Dr. Deming, what's on your mind? I have only three words for you. By what method? And I guess he was talking to Jack here on this two-party call. Of course we need a method, uh, so thanks for the reminder, Dr. Deming. 
Hmm. Hmm. We got a free party call. Dr. Evil is on the line. What would you like to add? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The strategy is top secret. Just do what I tell you. Anyone recognize that situation? Well, maybe not as extreme, you know, Dr. Evil and, and so on, but I think in a lot of companies we tend to forget that it's, it's so important with the trust and collaboration, primarily between the business side of things and the development side of things, to working together with trust and collaboration. It's crucially important. So, yeah, top secret strategy, just do what I tell you. Don't go there, don't follow Dr. Evil. So how do you develop your strategy? How do you do that? How do you co-create a strategy that is valid? Let's explore that for a while. So this is an experiment, you know, talking about direction, talking about endpoints, you know, needs, long-term key performance indications. So what are our needs? So this is, you know, just setting the direction. More value to exceed customers' expectations. Faster time to market to be more responsive. Better quality to secure trust, 75% engaged people as the foundation. So this was a long-term thing. It was set five years into the future. And uh, this was pretty, pretty cool, actually. And the key learnings for this was it was so good to have a stable long-term uh, KPI or, or key performance indicators, not having a fluffy long-term vision, making it concrete. And uh, having it stable gives a lot of clarity and a lot of focus. It was ambitious, you know, 10 times, 4 times, 2 times, so we realized we needed to do something radically different. It was balanced to secure that we avoided sub-optimization, you know, lead time at all costs, sacrificing quality, for instance. And it was also really good and easy to show progress towards these quantified measures to give us energy to continue on the journey and, of course, show our stakeholders that we were making some progress. But it was not the next quarter, it was not the next month, or even the next year, it was coming five years. And we actually did achieve those targets. So I think it's good to start with the needs and setting direction or vision. Then, another experiment, finding a, you know, a metaphor, a simple, iterative, incremental way of doing or setting up your strategy as iterative choices. So this is called playing to win. It's a sport metaphor and people relate to sport much e more easily than to military or war and stuff. So here you talk about your winning proposition. We're in this to win the hearts and minds of our customers. How are we going to do that? Then you make choices. Where are we going to play? What's the playing field? Are we going to play handball or football or ice hockey? What choices do we make here? Based on those choices of where to play, how are we going to win? It's outside in, starting from customers, starting from the winning proposition. What's the playing field? How are we going to play there? What choices do we make? So strategy is about making choices. What, do we going to, what are we going to do and what are we not going to do? Super important. And framing it in this sports metaphor helps a lot. So based on where to play, how to win, then what capabilities do we need? What capabilities do we have? What capabilities do we need to build? So this is iterative, it's not linear. So you go back and forth and you iterate and you learn when you do this. And final step, what kind of enabling structures, you know, what kind of systems and measures do we need for you know, making this happen? So the learnings here was that sports is a very useful metaphor. People can relate to this, and it really works on all levels. Talking about fractal things, you know, it works on individual level, it works on team level, it works on program level, it works on organizational level. So that's really cool. And we got a very focused description of our strategy. You know, it could be written on five slides, one for each of these areas, not 50 pages of boring Word or PowerPoints. That was pretty cool. Moving on, you know, another experiment. Visualize your value offering. So this fishbowl is, should be red. It's a red ocean. A lot of fish that are eating each other. And then, you know, we want to move, want to fly to the next blue ocean. So this is sort of blue ocean strategy where you want to find a, a, a brilliant spot where you sort of differentiate and you make yourself unique. And how do you do that? Well. 
you do storytelling, of course, like this, having nice visualizations. But you can also have this simple graph where on the horizontal, sorry, vertical axis, you have your offering level. Is it high, like five or low, uh, one, say? And on the, the horizontal axis, you pick a number of competing factors that are important for your industry or for your market. And then you just plot. You know, in blue, you plot yourself, and in red, you plot one or several of your competitors. And the key thing here is, of course, that it triggers a conversation. Because all those hidden assumptions that people may have on what makes us unique and what is good for competition, you put them out on, on, on a whiteboard. It's, you shouldn't really do this on a PowerPoint, but you should be a number of people gathering around the whiteboard and do this together as a collaborative, co-creative exercise. So many insights uh, on, on war, what you will do and what decisions and actions to take um, based on this common understanding when you plot this. And of course, it's hard to find those competing factors. That's hard. And it's sometimes hard to know exactly what your competitors are doing and how, how you are doing. But that's a trigger for going out and getting data and having conversations with customers, potentially, as well. OK, another visualization. And I'm not going to go through the details, but this is also very, very good to trigger conversations. You know, visualizing your value chain and how it evolves. So you have a value chain. You start with a customer at the top. And the customer, in this case, needs you know play games, console or mobile, gaming, PC, Mac, or on a virtual reality headset. And then you can sort of follow those needs and capabilities that are needed to, to build those needs via you know your game platform all the way down to power. You know, plug it in to the wall to get power. So that's a chain of needs. On the other axis, you have sort of evolution from uncharted to industrialize. You have some kind of genesis, totally creative thing, custom-built product or commodity. So once again, this tool, which is it's a tool, but it triggers the conversations. So you can agree on how your product or your service looks like. So you shouldn't have a PowerPoint. Once again, you should be at the whiteboard, uh, drawing this together and having the conversation to get the insights on what are those needs. Then, of course, you can start making decisions on, OK, should we do this ourselves? If it's a commodity, well, of course, we, we don't build the power. If it's a product, should we buy it or should we build it? Or should we outsource the development to someone else? So this is an extremely cool visualization that will help you to make those hard choices, make those decisions, and come up with your strategy by drawing it together. Starting from the customer, taking it all the way down to, to power, and then um, you know, get those consent decisions in a much quicker way, because you're co-creating this picture. And by doing that, uh, you get those hidden assumptions and those hidden um, insights, because some people are very intuitive, but you get it sort of up on the whiteboard. It takes a lot of practice, I, I can tell you that. It takes a lot of iteration, it takes some time. Those are the, the sort of negative learnings, uh, just to be open with that. But it's so useful, totally useful. OK, moving on. How do you make your strategy happen? And of course, as this Merbius strip shows, it's, it's related. It's really two sides of the same coin. How do you develop your strategy and how do you make it happen? It's yin and yang. Uh, it's not, you know, you do one thing separately from the other. But I think this is really, really important, this alignment and autonomy. You may think that they are separate concepts. Either you have total alignment or you have total autonomy. But it's not. It's not binary. It's not either or. You can have both. So if you plot alignment on the intent, the what and why, on the uh, vertical axis, and you plot autonomy on the horizontal axis, that's the actions, the decisions, the how. So by co-creating alignment or coherence on the what and why you're going to do, or on the principles, then you can create a lot of freedom on the actions, the decisions, and, and uh, 
how to do things, the methods or the tools. So strong alignment gives you the possibility to have maximum autonomy. And then that helps everyone in the organization to take the right action and to take the right decisions. So you enable a lot of freedom. And we all know freedom and autonomy through Dan Pink's work is super important, but you also need some kind of alignment. You want to direct the energy in a, in a certain direction. That's also very, very important. And that should be coherent and it should be co-created. So this was an insight in our way of making strategy happening. So long lead time from insights to action. So we had those strategy updates in, in Q1. Then we did some balanced scorecard in Q3. And then you updated the balanced scorecard in Q4. And then three quarters later, you started reporting on those targets. And uh, well, were they still valid? Because you know, the rate of change will never be slower than today. But this is where we started, and it was terrible. So the, the rapidly changing world meant that our targets were quickly outdated. So instead, we did regular strategy retrospectives. And that's, you know, quarterly. You sit down together and involve the whole organization um, by, you know, looking at our long-term key performance indicators, looking at the current business situation, looking at the current challenge and the current strategy and what we have learned from that and the, the ongoing experiments. And then, you know, setting a new challenge because a challenge is something that sort of triggers the whole organization to do experiments, trials, prototypes to improve and get better. So you want to, tap into the creative energy of the whole organization, and that will take you toward your long-term um, key performance indicators. So the learnings from this experiment was that it was really good to have this regular and positive reinforcement of, of our strategy and of the, the long-term wanted position. And it was much faster, of course, to move from insights to action. We had sort of a quarterly cycle. And the progress was made visible on a quarterly basis. So people could see that we were making much more progress. And I don't have this on the slides, but we actually took it down even to, to sprints. So we had three week sprints. So we had sort of strategy sessions every sprint, not only every quarter, sort of to, to sort of help us with the experiments and, and see how we were doing to make the strategy happening. So it can be done and it's all about the cadence. You go from yearly cadence down to quarters or even to sprints, also for your strategy. Okay, so this is a bit more on, on how we did this, to dig it a bit deeper. So we had a challenge, which is sort of one thing, and this case it was every sprint delivered to a live network, a live mobile telecom network. And we had our, our business leadership team and our development leadership team agreeing on this as a first step. Then we engaged the whole organization in half day uh, exercises, half-day team exercise. Okay, what are we going to do to contribute to making this happen? Um, we also said that you have 30%, everyone has 30% to do experiments, demos, prototypes, learning uh, at their disposal to make this happen. So this is what lean gurus call push the form and pull the content. So you give some, some uh, direction and you give the what and why and then you give autonomy on how to do it. And the learnings here were really that it was good to have clear expectations, um, but it was a bit hard to get bigger things to happen still with this. Okay, um, final experiment, sort of a simple operating system for making your strategy happen. It's called four disciplines of execution and uh, don't uh, care so much about the words, discipline, execution. Um, because this is really cool, actually. First thing is focus. Focus on the most important thing. Pick one, maximum two things. And this we, we've learned from you know, Flow and Kanban. It's limit your, your work in progress or process. This is really limiting the number of, of targets you're working on. Next thing is act on your lead measures. And this is something we've learned from startups and, and even lean startup. You shouldn't only you know, look at the measure gloss, what happened when it had rained, but you need to look at your lead measures, your, your barometer to see where you're heading, 
because um, otherwise you're always chasing the rabbit, you're always after the rabbit because you measure when things are done. So find your lead measures very early on and see how they relate to, to your focused lag targets. Okay, so that was number two. Number three, compelling scoreboard. Once again, a visualization. And this is a compelling scoreboard for the team, by the team. It's not for, for, for managers or for other teams. It's really to the team to show, are we winning? Are we losing? Are we drawing? How are our lead uh, measures going? How are the lag measures going? So it should be done by the team. And it can be a bit fun, some metaphor, some teams use Lego, and that's, that's always cool. And finally, you create a cadence of accountability. And this is similar to what we know from Scrum, you know, daily stand-up, that's a good thing. You create a, a sort of a cadence, a habit. And here it's at least weekly where you talk about commitments. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I've done. This is psychology. It's not commitment to your manager, it's commitment to your mates, uh, your, your colleagues in the team. And of course, it's about learning. What did I learn from last year? How did, or for last week? How did, did what I did contribute to the, the lead measures and the lag measures? So this experiment was also really, really cool. Uh, but it, what we learned was that it's, if you do all the four things, then you get the, the results, then you get the outcomes. If you start missing out on having this, this cadence, if you start doing every second week, then you start to forget, and then it gets boring. So I think this, this, that's another learning that, that we saw. So really go all in to all four and start from there. That was the key, key success factor. And the teams that didn't, they started to degrade. Okay. So to wrap this up, what were the sort of patterns that, that we saw in these simple experiments and those learnings? Well, visualization, compelling scoreboards, having those strategy uh, canvases, having this worldly map where you see the needs, and that triggers a conversation which triggers collaboration. So you involve people and you interact. Also, the, the alignment or to get the coherence, how to co-create that and to get feedback loops quickly and, uh, you know, get then the autonomy for people. So the combination of alignment for autonomy. So final question, how do you want to do strategy? Thank you. Thank you, Eric.